Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to this Cambridge Union event on American democracy. Um, a very big thing these days. I'm Adam Davies. I'm president of the union. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. So the question, as I just said, of this uh, topic of this panel is where does American democracy go from here? So we have a really distinguished group of panelists here, and I'm really excited to hear what they have to say. The way it's going to work format wise is that we're going to go around. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. So this our four panelists, and then we're going to have a more um, open Q and A at the end. So, if you have any questions, just drop them in the chat right next to this stream. So, our first panelist is uh, Mary France Berry, who is the professor of the Siegel Professor of American Social Thought at the University of Pennsylvania, and served as chair of the United States Commission on Civil Rights from 1993 to 2004. Professor Berry. I think you're muted. Um, if you could just. Hello. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, Martin Luther King uh, wrote a, uh, published a book in 1967 called Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? And when you ask where American democracy is going, one could use the same subtitle, except that I don't think we're headed toward chaos, and I'm not sure about community. In fact, we have the same major problems that other countries have in the world right now, the pandemic, the economic crisis that has upended all of our institutions and the way we do things. But in addition, we set off a crisis again over race and policing in our country, which continues and which um, I think in the end, the important thing about it is that it crosses racial lines. There are many uh, folks who are not black uh, who are involved in the protests and who are very offended by the deaths. And even of George Floyd uh, set these off, but there have been another one since. And even as we're talking, there's probably somewhere somebody's is getting <laughs> killed who is unarmed by the police. All of these have triggered uh, responses uh, defund the police, uh, reimagine the police, and all the rest. Uh, I think the protests will probably continue uh, so long as we have the, 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 the triple crises going on in the country. And there may be some results. So far, there have been positive ones. There was a, there's a bill in the House and in the Senate, and we may get some police reform. Even President Trump issued an executive order, which was a first step. Uh, and a small step, but it says that mental health professionals will be uh, assigned to police. They need that. Uh, and it also has some uh, restrictions on what kind of force can be used. But the overriding problem, which is that the police are the enforcers of capitalism and white racism and white supremacy, uh, has not gone away. And we've seen the movie time and time again. It's happened in all the years that I've been working uh, on these issues because we've not come to grips with it. Maybe we will this time. One of the things that people say is that our presidential election will decide what we do going forward. James Bryce uh, in his American Commonwealth, uh, I think it was 1888 uh, when he published that, has a chapter, which is chapter eight, I think, which talks about why don't great men ever run and become president in the United States. And I was always fascinated by that chapter. And I thought, it, what do you mean by great? I guess everybody has a definition. And it is indeed, he had lots of arguments for why they don't run. You can make more money in business, uh, not as much scrutiny. He, he has all kinds of things. But one of the things he said is that Americans seem to be comfortable with mediocrity. Uh, and that's the lesson to draw. And we have problems because we have only two political parties and the parties are the problem, which were never in the constitution. I believe to this election year, we're faced with the same crisis. There are no great men <laughs> or women for that matter, running for president of the United States seriously. And we seem to be uh, continuing uh, the pattern that we've had in the past. We had Barack Obama, who was well-meaning, but he didn't solve the crisis over white supremacy and capitalism. It's a hard thing. Monuments are the latest target. Monuments as well as unarmed black people. And I think that that will continue uh, until that is resolved too. So we're not gonna have chaos because we've gone through crises before. We've recovered from them. We will recover from these, this particular crisis 
all of them, economics, the pandemic, and the racial crisis too, because we in the United States of America, that is what we do. Uh, but it will take some time and I don't believe that uh, white supremacy and um, uh, capitalism will uh, go away uh, as a result. Great, thank you very much for those comments, Professor Barry. Our next speaker is Anthony Scaramucci, who served as probably most famously as White House Communications Director in July 2017, but also worked as financier and in a variety of other roles, including uh, conferences. Uh, Anthony, the floor is yours. Sorry, I just had to unmute, uh, but you know, I, I appreciate Professor uh, Barry's comments. You know, I, I would say three things. Uh, we have had great men run for president. There's one on this podcast, uh, General Wesley Clark, who, uh, among many other things, uh, was commander of NATO, Rhodes Scholar, and a, a brilliant uh, statesman. But one of the problems in the United States, unfortunately, is it's not a hiring process in the United States. It's a popularity contest, somewhat similar to high school elections. And so if we sat around as a group of board members and we said, okay, here's what we need in a president. Uh, we need empathy, we need healing, we need somebody that has intellectual curiosity. We have somebody that can actually call out the problems without making anybody on either side feel victimized, but just slaying out the case for what's happened from a sociological and psychological perspective. Uh, and then had a long-term plan. Uh, and a vision. If we sat around in a board and we did that, uh, we could select somebody. Then I think that those men referenced in that essay or that chapter would probably come forward, even, even be willing to subject themselves to the scrutiny and the personal attacks and things like that. Uh, for those of you that have never been in the crossfire of uh, politics, uh, it is absolutely brutal. You know, as, as some of you may know, I got ejected from the White House after 11 days I was shot into Pennsylvania Avenue like an Austin Powers villain. And then I was vilified in the nation's tabloids for about three or four days. My son, who just graduated on Zoom from a uh, Stanford Business School class uh, last week, he put a 14 minute uh, thing together of all the late night comedians attacking me, which was actually one of the funniest things I've ever seen. I hope it never ends up on a YouTube channel because it'll get like 5 million views. But it's brutal, okay? And you get rolled in broken glass and you're forced to drink sulfuric acid. Uh, but let me tell you something, the country is worth it, okay? Even though I failed at it and uh, it was a short stint for me, uh, the opportunity to work in public service, and Professor Berry mentioned this before we went into this live call, uh, if the President of the United States is asking you to do something and you love the country and you wanna see progress, uh, of course you wanna do that. Um, I'm gonna end it with two last points. Uh, uh, politicians are asked if there's institutional racism. And some of them are saying that there is an institutional racism and others are saying that there, there is institutional racism. And it almost seems like even that is polarized. Uh, there was a great New Yorker uh, cartoon from last week, which uh, I'll share with you guys. It was, a, it was a anchor man and he was sitting at the anchor desk and he said, well, we just got the weather from the Democratic weather person. Now let's get the weather from the Republican weather person. And it seems like that's what's going on now in our society. And so if we're gonna argue about the facts and we can't even get the facts straight, how are we gonna have this clinical intellectual debate that we all need to have? So, you know, I can just give you my 56 year observation on planet earth. There is institutional racism. Some of it is born from our atavism, some of it is born from a lack of enlightenment or, or lack of experience, some of it is taught from our parents, uh, but there is a level of institutional racism. And, you know, I'm not ashamed by that. Uh, we all got born into this world and didn't pick our families. I certainly didn't pick my skin color or family of my origin or things like that. I'm not ashamed by it, but until we actually call it out for what it is, uh, and, and then start to realize how we can potentially deal with it, it's not gonna go away. And unfortunately we have one half, and I happen to be a Republican as most of you know, 
Uh, we have one half of our society in our two-party system that still wants to run down that path of misinformation. I think it's very, very dangerous. Uh, and we need to fix that. And that party needs to be fixed. Great, thank you very much for that as well, uh, Ms. Scaramucci. Our next panelist is General Wesley Clark, who led NATO troops during the intervention in Kosovo during his tenure as Supreme Allied Commander of Europe from 1997 to 2000, and was a Democratic candidate for president in 2004. Uh, more recently, he has founded Renew America Together, a group to promote civility and bipartisanship in politics. General Clark. I think you're muted. Okay, great. I should be open now. Thank you very much, Adam. It's great to be on this panel and see so many old friends and people I've, I've admired for a long time, like Mary Frances, Anthony Scaramucci, Elizabeth, it's very nice to see you here. Um, I go back, you ask about democracy, you've got to go back to the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> Those words in the preamble that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that people are endowed with inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit. God, those words, they're so powerful. They have frightened tyrants and autocrats for two and a half centuries. They've inspired hope in billions of people. They've brought incredible talent to the shore, but we still can't quite live up to them. And that's the real challenge of American democracy. And we've been through cycle and trauma and we, were, we wrote those words with slavery in our midst, and we had to fight a terrible war to end that practice. I look at where we're headed is in historical context first, and you have to see um, American politics since the Civil War is 60, 70 year cycles. It's about the lifetime of powerful people. They get Im ideas embedded and they carry these ideas with them and they build political power and they implement those ideas. So, you know, at the end of the Civil War, we became industrialized and it took 40 years, 50 years of economic development before people looked at, at the titans of industry and the trusts and said, this is absolutely wrong, this concentration of wealth and the exploitation of labor. And then we moved into the progressive era out of the Gilded Age. And it took two decades, two and a half decades of uh, well, Woodrow Wilson stole the ideas from Theodore Roosevelt, and then Franklin really put them in using the crisis of the Depression, and then they followed through to Lyndon Johnson, and even Nixon said we were all Keynesians in the early 70s. Goldwater started the opposite push, so in 1980, we entered what we call the age of Reagan. It's been 40 years of uh, Gordon Gekko on Wall Street and an incredible uh, expansion of wealth in America, but only for the top people. And the topper you are, the greater the expansion. And the headlines are still saying, you know, billionaires now, they, they made like 20% more, 30% more over the last three months. You can see the turning of the tide because you can feel the energy on the left. Dramatic change in America never happens without incredible civic energy. In the 19, uh, 19, 19, 20, it was incredible labor unrest, the Red Scare, uh, but, but it gave unions power. There was the depression and, and the bonus marchers. And, and in the 1960s, the civil rights movement um, added the, the final sort of kick that pushed us into progressivism, but, but, but now, we sort of lulled into consumerism. Credit cards gave Americans the chance to buy things they really couldn't afford. And we built an economy built on debt and student loan debt, car debt, credit card debt, house debt, business debt, junk bonds. Anthony and I know all the stories in the economy and how it's worked and it brought incredible growth, but you can see the energy on the left. Change is coming and it's going to be pushed by the fact that there's a lot of excess time available when people are out of work and at home and they're focusing on their lives. Uh, so there's a big push coming. Maybe it'll happen in 2020, maybe it'll be 2024, 2028, but the age of Reagan's drawing to a close. And Adam, it's people of your generation that have got to take us forward, redefine 
how we use the incredible strength of the market and private enterprise, which we can't get rid of, but at the same time, have a more just and equitable society that encourages everybody to give their best in a spirit of community, but also doing what's good for their families. Somehow we have to build on the ideals of the Declaration of Independence with a more workable, fair, just, equitable system without throwing out the motivations for people, individual excellence. That's the challenge of democracy. Well, thank you very much as well for those very thoughtful remarks, uh, General Clark. Our final kind of speaker in this round robin is uh, Elizabeth Cobbs, who's an author and is the Glasscock Chair in American History at Texas A&M. Elizabeth? When the 19-year-old Marquis de Lafayette ran away from home and sailed for America to offer his services to George Washington against the wishes of his king and worse, his father-in-law, he wrote a farewell letter to his young wife, who was 17, and he asked her to be a good American in his absence. What he meant was that he hoped she would live by the transcendent ideals that America symbolized and that Lafayette wanted for his own country and for people everywhere. What this present moment is about is about reinvigorating those ideals and deciding, as we've had to decide many times since 1776, do we want an unaccountable coercive government or do we want a transparent law-abiding government based on the idea that all men are created equal. This is coming up again because we have seen a long, slow erosion over three decades in these principles uh, that has speeded up in the past three years. So one element, of course, and people have referred to this, is the erosion of equality, setting aside the obvious problem of dire inequality in policing and sentencing of Black people. We have other examples in the emergence of a shocking intergenerational equality, inequality fueled by student debt of a type we never saw before the 1980s. And also unprecedented voter inequality fueled by the 2010 Supreme Court decision to remove all limits on corporate campaign contributions. So I as an individual can contribute about $2,000 to a political campaign and, um, and a corporation can give 500 million or whatever they want. So, Perhaps even more striking though than the question of equality is the erosion of rule of law. America's founders believed the rule of law was our best and really only defense against the corruption and demagoguery that otherwise have always plagued republics. In the United States, the rule of law has two levels. There's a foreign policy level and a domestic policy level and each reinforces the other. The US has had only really two major foreign policies in its entire history writ large. Uh, from 1776 to 1947, about 170 years, we had a policy of no ongoing military or political alliances with foreign governments. We were a neutral country. That was called George Washington's great rule. And then from about 1947 up until virtually the present, our policy has been to foster and largely dominate foreign alliances and provide military security for all takers. That's called the Truman Doctrine. Well, our allies encouraged this because there was a power vacuum at the end of World War II um, that was very critical. But that problem ended with European recovery and the implosion of the Soviet Union in 1991. But instead of seeking a new role at that time, the United States in a way kind of doubled down, acting with greater impunity than ever. Uh, our involvement in unsanctioned wars actually increased, especially after 9-11. Uh, Ignoring international rules, we give cover to others who want to ignore, in, ignore international rules. Now, both President Obama and Trump talked about, um, but did not deliver a new policy, whether from lack of consistency or courage. Here's my suggestion. We can call it the millennial doctrine uh, for the start of the new millennium, which is after all only 20 years old. Henceforth, the US will do everything in its power to encourage and support international institutions and alliances as an equal and law abiding member with no more responsibility for military security than any other, which means we can do a lot because others can do a lot. Now rule of law is also broken down at home uh, because our law enforcers don't respect the law. 
Now, an ongoing example in the current one is the amplification of qualified immunity for police departments by a series of Supreme Court decisions since the 1980s. This has contributed to the violence against Black Americans by our own police forces. It's also compounded by the military equipping of our police officers as a spillover from our wars. So we allow our own police officers to not follow the law. This has all been compounded by President Trump, who praised electoral violence in 2016 uh, in his campaign, who vowed he could shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue and get away with it, who boasted he could grope the genitalia of women at will, and ha now has a case before the Supreme Court asking for immunity while in office from investigation from possible criminal actions as a private citizen. When the nation's chief law enforcement officer and our police officers have immunity, hold themselves above law, chaos does result in a betrayal of democracy. So holding our nations to its laws is inherently important, of course, but it's going to be more important going forward. We have a global health crisis. If Americans don't follow their own public health laws, millions could die, as did in 1918. Global warming is going to create even greater disruption of the food chain. So we need to actually be prepared for closer international cooperation than ever before. The public response to the killing of George Floyd shows we have reached, I hope, a tipping point in tolerance for police targeting of black Americans. The good thing, however, and here's the silver lining, is that the erosion of standards historically can lead to their reemergence in stronger form. In 1776, violations of Americans' rights as British citizens led to the creation of a democratic republic. In the middle of the 19th century, Southern uh, insistence on stronger and stronger guarantees of slavery sparked a civil war that led to the abolition of slavery altogether. In 1939, the Nazi attempt to create an empire over all of Europe led to the destruction of the Third Reich and the creation of the European Union, European Union and the United Nations. Today, outrage over the death, the killing of George Floyd. Recognition that in a pandemic, we all have to take care of one another. And I hope repugnance at the idea that any American is above the law can guide us back to our values, can make us stronger and freer and more equal if we work at it can help us be what the Mar Marquis de Lafayette meant when he asked his French wife to be a good American. Great, thank you very much for that as well, Elizabeth. Um, just a few questions for me to be selfish and uh, use my uh, power as chair to answer something I'm curious about. One thing um, that many of you talked about was kind of a generational shift in American politics. There's also energy and left, these all these other things. But in the 2020 um, Democratic nomination contest, we had kind of one of the biggest fields ever, a really young field, really diverse field. And yet the person that ended up winning was kind of an old guy, old white man that had been in the Senate for decades. Do you think that says anything about American democracy that we picked Joe Biden? To any of you? I think it shows that we're scared. <laughs> I'd like to say something. Yeah, please say. Um, I think that what has happened in 2020 uh, reinforces the notion that our political system needs some changing. Um, we have, we need to go back to the basic format of the Constitution. The Constitution never envisioned political parties, in fact. And now we have political parties, but we only have two of them for all intents and purposes. When someone runs a campaign uh, on a third party ticket, we call it, <laughs> they are vilified by people in both parties as, or the party that thinks it might be hurt by the person there. So options that could be put on the table are never put on the table, or if they are, they're dismissed. The rules of the parties, this year, it was the rules of the Democratic Party which made it well nigh impossible for any of those uh, array of candidates that we saw out there to ever get beyond the threshold requirements to go on to the finish line or to be in other states where they might be voted on. In fact, uh, maybe the example of the Republicans coming up last 
timing in with Trump and having a more open process. Maybe that's why they changed it. But in fact, the money and the, uh, the endorsements and all that stuff uh, made it so that those uh, candidates, the black uh, folk, the Latino uh, candidate and some of the governors, none of them had a chance from the beginning and the establishment had it rigged, Bernie Sanders was correct, that he ended up just being called a socialist. So he was not anybody who would go anywhere. And Elizabeth Warren as anti-capitalist in a big campaign. And so you end up with Biden. Everybody knew that in South Carolina, black older black voters would follow the lead of Jim Clyburn and vote for him. And then in the other states where Trump is going to win in the general election, at least in the primary, he would win. Our system needs to change. We need more than two political parties. There's no reason for us to have two political parties with more options on the table. And in fact, people are called upon to vote in the end, even though their options have already been limited, which is why we go on with these problems that we never solve, in my opinion. So Bryce was right about the parties being the problem. You know, politics is about celebrity, and uh, you can't get started in it at the presidential level without celebrity. And what you saw in this year's campaign for the Democratic nomination was that uh, Joe Biden was a known figure and that people, wherever he went inside the party, they knew him. They'd known him for 30, 40 years. He had a compelling life story. Um, and even though he didn't have the energy and he didn't have the power of the progressive movement behind him at the outset, he had, he was reliable and he was trustworthy. And he, con contrasting that to um, the man in office today, it, it, it just forced people to go on some, somebody you know, somebody who's reliable, somebody you trust, put off the big change. First, get this guy out of office. And step by step, that's kind of what emerged. Maybe Elizabeth Warren would have done better had she not gone so far to the left and then backtracked on, 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 on uh, Medicare for all. But, you know, you can critique the individual tactics. But the big thing is there are a lot of great people in America who could run for office who can't because they lack the celebrity. The irony of this is that the Republican Party, which always says that Hollywood leans to the left, has had a movie actor for president and a reality TV star for president. Isn't that ironic? But it's and also true, Wes, wait. It's also true. The way it works in America. It is in the 19th century, generals were well known. So you had several as president. In the 20, 21st century, entertainment is king. And um, those are the people who capture the imagination of the ordinary Americans. Gotcha. So um, I'm guessing there isn't a lot of optimism for the Biden presidency then from you guys. If Professor you Barry that. wants to talk. To oh, of course. Go ahead, yeah. What I want to say is that the reason why we've had division, greater polarization in this country than I've ever seen, uh, starting with the day that Trump got elected, uh, because he didn't think he'd get elected and most of us didn't think he'd get elected. And so it was a shock to the system. And the resistance, I know for a fact, because I was part of it, started on that day. And the resistance has never ended and it's not going to end. It's grown bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And the reluctance and refusal of people in his own party who were experienced and knew what to do to come and work for him to even, and I know from experience that even if a president doesn't agree with you and even if there are a lot of things you don't like about him, you can whisper in his ear from time to time and get things done. But if you're not there, you can't. So all of that sort of fell apart and we've been resisting ever since in countless ways, but the major problems in our society, we talk about race, we talk about capitalism, and now we have the pandemic and all the rest of it don't get solved in the way they should be solved because of this disruption in a sense. If the disruption, disruption leads to change, positive change, that's great. 
which is why I want the protests to continue. But we're not going to get positive change with Joe Biden, the establishment candidate for president. And I've been around and watching in, in places with this guy for years. He's a great guy. He's fun. He's wonderful. But he is not the guy to make the change that we need. Obama couldn't make it. He hasn't made it. And the more things go on simmering like this, it's just going to take us longer to make the change that we need. And that's what many young people say to me. They say, you look like, you act like a young person. <laughs> You're talking about change. <laughs> this is the change we need, and that's the change they want. I, I would actually disagree. Um, you know, Adam, you said you don't think there's a lot of optimism in this room about Biden. And let me say, I am in disagreement with that. I. You know, I think yeah, Biden has been around forever in that way, sort of like uh, LBJ had been around forever. And when he became president, tragically and unexpectedly because of Jack Kennedy's death, um, there was this idea, well, who is this guy? I, I think Biden is like that. I think a Biden is somebody who is responsive to the outrage of this moment, who um, as a Southerner, Know, is aware of racism and its terrible legacy in American life. So I, I actually am very optimistic about Biden. I think once he gets into office, he will prove to be a president much more like uh, LBJ, in fact, than Obama was. Um, and somebody who, because of this moment, I'm hoping, will be able to ride uh, this new crest of um, concern for American ideals and belief that we have to do something to be the kind of people we want to be. Uh, as as Kennedy said, we can do better. I think, Adam, that if, if Joe Biden has the backing in the Congress, he can do amazing things. And here's the um, here's the, the difficulty in the American political system is that all the people on this panel follow politics all the time, but most of America actually does it. It's, it's like the World Series and baseball. You know, in September, you say, well, well who, isn't the World Series coming up? And then people start, well, who's going to play? And I, there's some guy, uh, A-Rod or something, who's a big star. Where would he come from? And they suddenly pick it up and they don't, it's not, and, and then it's election time. And one party succeeds by keeping people away from the polls. It's the most amazing thing. When I explain to my friends in Europe, how American democracy works and, and, and what voter suppression is and gerrymandering and rigging the ballot so you can't read it and turning off election mach uh, voting machines in selective and, and where you put the poll, they, they couldn't believe it. They don't wanna believe these things about America. So it's not just the president, it's the whole election system and it's a vicious fight. And the thing is, it's always been a vicious fight. You know, from the time that Andrew Jackson was <clears throat> criticized as a bigamist. And I mean, it's always been ugly in American politics. It's what Anthony said, you got to get in and take the heat. You got to be prepared to be hit with the wire brush again and again to fight for what's right. And um, as that energy builds up on the left, Mary Francis, it may not be in 2020. It may take another four years, but that energy will bring change. This is what's so beautiful about democracy. It is the consent of the governed. And when enough people feel strongly enough and make their presence felt in protest, not just at the ballot box, but at protest, and take the personal risk of going out there, America changes. And it's overdue right now, in my view. Yeah, I want to I tell a quick story. It'll, it'll be brief, but I think it'll be instructive. So I'm, I'm a Republican. My dad was a crane operator, and he was in a union for 42 years. Why am I a Republican? Well, the Republican Party controlled the unions in Nassau County on Long Island. And so when I was 17 years old and I was getting ready to register to vote on my 18th birthday, I said, Dad, what am I registering? And I said, well, you're registering as a Republican. I had no idea what that even meant because he was in a union, his wages were going up as a result of the Republican party. It's very different from the rest of the country, frankly, because most of the people were Democrats. So now I'm a Republican. And I went through the Reagan revolution that General Clark talked about. 
And, uh, but I'm a moderate Republican. You know, I've, I've, I've worked on the gay marriage initiative. I've worked on the women's right to choose and different things, but I stayed as a Republican. So guess what I end up as? I end up as an establishment Republican. I'm working for Jeb Bush. He's blown from the race by Donald Trump. And I get a call from Donald Trump. You're great on TV. Come up and see me, blah, 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 blah. I didn't want to work for him. I said, okay, this guy's nuts. I went up the elevator, went to go see him. I spent an hour with him. I said, you know what? I'm a Republican. I'm a lifelong Republican. This guy won it. Everybody took a pledge that they were going to support the Republican. I'm going to go support the Republican. So now I fly with him to Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's my first campaign trip. And what I saw in Albuquerque, New Mexico was shocking to me, and I want to share it with everybody. Uh, I grew up in a blue collar family, but it was an aspirational part of America. We were an aspirational working class family. My dad came home, strict Italian American, do your homework. Someday you're going to be rich and you're going to live in one of those big houses. You're going to live the American dream. And when I got to Albuquerque, New Mexico, what I saw panicked me because I was crossing the security perimeter, going into the civic center and saying, excuse me, why are you here? I took my secret service pin off, put it in my pocket. Why are you here? And I left that civic center in great sadness because the people were there because in 35 short years, those blue collar families that went from aspirational working class families became desperational. And I got back on the plane with the candidate and we were heading for California to a big billionaire's fundraising house. And I went on the internet and I figured out what my dad's wages were in 1976. And I looked over at Mr. Trump and I said, you know, my dad, if he had the same job here in 2016, his wages would be down 26 and a half percent. He could have never afforded the family or the house that we lived in. And there's, there's a lot of different things going on in America right now. That struggle is real in blue collar America. There's something going on in black America, if you can even call it black America, because it's a mosaic of people. That struggle is real. Uh, but the problem is we've got tribal leadership now. And so we have nobody sitting there saying, wait a minute, the first name of the United States is United. Let me figure out a way to stitch this thing back together and get people thinking about the core themes of why they are American, like Lafayette wanted his wife or fiance to be. I'm American because of my grandparents. They took enormous risk to come here to start this life. I love this country in a way that I can't fully express. And I believe what Lincoln said, that it's the last best hope for mankind. Is it a flawed country? Absolutely. Do we have institutional racism in this country? Trust me, we do. My grandmother couldn't get a job in 1923. They had, they had signs that said, no Italians need apply in the storefronts in Brooklyn. I'm gonna make one last point. When the president went after those four Congresswomen, I'm a Republican, I don't necessarily like their ideas. When he went after them, I called Mayor Giuliani. I said, you're, you're gonna allow this? I am not gonna disavow my personal life story and my personal integrity or the honor that I have for my grandmother. Okay, they told my grandmother that racist nativist trope a hundred years ago, go back to the country that you originally came from. So he's telling three congresswomen, four congresswomen, three of which are born in the United States, one of which who naturalized as a citizen, all four democratically elected into our Congress to go back to the country that they originally came from. Come on, guys. Okay, enough is enough. And so what I'm sore about as a Republican and somebody who loves the country, that we've got a bunch of yahoos in the Republican controlled Senate that they could allow somebody like this to hijack them and for them to subvert their core principles and their core patriotism to this sort of nonsense. Okay, I'm off my soapbox, but I just wanna point out to you, there's a lot going on in this country that needs to be fixed simultaneously. It's not just one segment of the country. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Yeah, no, I, you know, I read some meme recently that you can't uh, say you're the party of Republic of, of uh, Abraham Lincoln and fly the Confederate flag. <laughs> you just can't do those two things. Um, but I think that what is so exciting right now is that um, 
that there is this, I think, resurgence of a sense of what American values are. I was raised as a Catholic, you know, and around the time that John Kennedy ran for the um, presidency. And I remember you know, people, my, grown -up, uh, my parents talking about how Kennedy had gone to West Virginia and said, I don't think West Virginians are bigoted. And, you know, Protestant West Virginians looked him in the face and said, you know, we are not, you know, we are Americans. And so I think that, you know, what's exciting is to see how the uh, support for Black Lives Matter has really flipped around as something like, you know, nearly 70% of Americans, 67% of Americans who support Black Lives Matter because those are American lives and, um, you know, human lives, I should say more importantly. So I think that this is actually, this is why in some ways this is such an exciting moment, such a plastic moment, if you will, in American history. Um, I think of it sometimes as like the 60s, by which I mean the 1760s and the 1860s and the 1960s. We do have these cycles, as Wesley was saying in American history, where we come back and we look ourselves in the mirror and then we say, who do we want to be? Who are we? Are we good Americans? Very interesting. Um, I'm going to relay a question from the audience now. I think everyone's tired of hearing my thoughts. Um, so Keen Mintz Wu asks, what is the link between encouraging democratic norms abroad and democratic actions at home? And he's thinking particularly uh, in relation to Hong Kong. Um, so General Clark, do you want to start on that? Do you think there's a yes, connection? I <clears throat> Look, I mean, <laughs> we couldn't have done worse for the people of Hong Kong than clear Lafayette Square. By doing that, the United States legitimated every measure of repression that the Chinese government wants to, to take on Hong Kong. And really, um, it, it's kind of what Elizabeth was saying, since 9-11, somehow the United States lost its moral compass. We always said when I was in the army that we were better than other people. We didn't torture people. After 9-11, we decided we would torture people. We decided that in the name of national security, we could do everything that every tin pot dictator did everywhere in the world when he was uh, afraid of losing his power. And we allowed American values to collapse. That collapse is shown by what happened in Lafayette Square. And it definitely undercuts our ability to <clears throat> go to China and say, what you're doing in Hong Kong? <clears throat> is not only wrong, it's going to backfire on you. No, our president has aligned us with dictators and autocrats all over the world. He seems to admire their power, their authority, their ability to use their military to, to knock people out of the way. And <clears throat> so behind the anger at the racism, which is, you know, it's swept across white America, Mary Francis. It's not just in the African-American community. If you look at the people on the street, they're mostly white and they're angry about it. But behind all that is the understanding that we're throwing away our values and our moral leadership in the world by the conduct of this government in office. Yeah, so I'm just to kind of, this uh, panel has taken on a very historical tinge. Um, one thing that was kind of consistent throughout like the Cold War was the use of African-American rights as a kind of weapon of propaganda by the Soviet Union. So um, idea that the Scottsboro Five and other African-Americans that were lynched and killed by white America delegitimized American claims to moral uh, superiority. So do you think there's anything different about 2020 then? Is it the same sort of story that we've been seeing over and over again that um, uh, other countries, other authoritarian states say that kind of America, white America's treatment of black people doesn't mean it's not really democracy. Is there something new about this moment? Professor Barry, do you want to say something? Am I unmuted? Yeah. Oh, you, you, you were unmuted, but you just muted yourself. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Great, thanks. You're, you're, I... you're good. I dare you. No, no, no. Good. Yeah. Uh, now I've forgotten the question. No, uh, I think that uh, we know from the history that much of the uh, civil rights change that came in the United States, um, beginning with the Eisenhower administration, occurred because of the contest between the Soviet Union and the United States for the hearts and minds of men, as they put it, in the developing world. 
and the new nations coming to the freedom and um, uh, to nationalism in Asia and Africa. That's just a matter of history. We know that that had great influence. Um, and now I guess, I was thinking about what Wes said about clearing Lafayette Square, gave the wrong signal to the Chinese. There's a sense in which, well, the Chinese already did that in Tiananmen Square, as I recall, with the youth and the tank and remember all the protests yep. uh, and they got rid of them uh, more or less. Uh, but I think that uh, I was wondering about Lafayette Square because no one likes to make excuses for violence, and I certainly would not. Uh, and certainly with the military um, engaging in oppressing people's freedoms. But uh, in fact, I think that what happened in Lafayette Square is not anywhere near the enormity of what has happened to the Chinese in Hong Kong. And that happened even before <laughs> the Lafayette Square uh, incident. The Chinese are quite willing on their own to engage in horrific behavior toward uh, people. Uh, and they don't need us to give them an excuse. I'll put it that way. The other thing is that I do not think that the problems that we have in the United States, I was thinking about what Elizabeth said about foreign policy and about um, uh, not giving military um, support, but other kinds of diplomatic support, if I understood it correctly. Uh, one of the debates that's been going on is whether we should have alliances and entangling alliances, George Washington would call them, or not, um, and whether countries should pay for <laughs> the support they give for us. That's one of the things which is sort of the Trump doctrine, which has created uh, some problems. Uh, but what I was noticing, and it doesn't really answer your question, uh, I was thinking all the while everybody was talking that uh, folks dismiss the idea that one of our principal problems is that we have two political parties. And we don't raise the issues or deal with them. And we assume that most of our elections recently have been choosing the lesser of two evils <laughs> and not really talking about the issues. And whether they're in foreign policy, whether they're in economic policy here, whether they're in race relations, whatever they're in, the problems just simply simmer and never get resolved. And all we do is say, well, if everybody would just vote or could vote, uh, then every of these problems would be solved. But the history teaches us that they aren't <laughs> even after we vote. And so maybe it's time to look at a new approach to all of these uh, issues rather than, uh, and whether we need parties or su to support uh, different parties rather than assuming the architecture has to stay which is what we do. We assume the architecture has to stay even though it isn't constitutional and that we just move on and the choices we have are the choices we have. And people say to me, I'm gonna hold my nose and vote for so-and-so. We shouldn't be in a position of always having to hold our noses and vote for people. We ought to be able to come turn out and vote for people who we care about since turnout is the major problem in major in, in American elections. And I think it's going to continue to be until we resolve this issue, which you didn't ask me about, but I think it's the fundamental issue. <laughs> and that's what we care about. Uh, is hearing what you guys say, not what I want to hear you say. Um, Elizabeth, uh, Mary Frances just disagreed with your thinking about um, foreign entanglements a bit. So I, wonder, I was wondering if you wanted to respond to her. Well, I think that, um, yeah, an entangling alliances was the phrase, quite right, Mary Frances, that George Washington used. I think that what we're looking towards, it, we, the world is very different from 1776. We build institutions like the World Health Organization. I mean, my gosh, this is like apple pie and motherhood, the World Health Organization that our president has now withdrawn from. You know, President Trump's idea of foreign policy reform is sort of like somebody thinking that to remodel the kitchen, you have to bulldoze the house right? We don't need to bulldoze the house. The house is a good house. We spent a lot of money building it. Uh, to remodel our foreign alliances is, is perfectly reasonable. So, uh, and I think that they are important because they are they symbolize world cooperation. They're what pulled us out of World War II. They're what gave us the world that we all inhabit now. But in terms of democracy promotion, kind of segue back to the other question here, I think the United States has always done its best work in democracy promotion 
by minding its own business. It's when we function well as a democracy that people say, yeah, I want some of that. And Mary Frances is quite right about this. I mean, the scale of you know, what happened in Tiananmen Square versus what happened in Lafayette, Lafayette Square um, just a week or so ago you know, is different. And I think people around the world look at that and go, I'd still rather have the Lafayette Square problem than the Tiananmen Square problem. And that's because when they see American democracy function, it's, it's very positive. I mean, in the way that when other democracies function well, we look to them in, in admiration. So aspirational, to go back to Anthony's term before, an aspirational America is America that, that lives up to its own laws, uh, that holds its people to those laws, um, and that you know, fulfills its own ideals. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think that's probably a good place to end this discussion. I think it's been really great. We're just about out of time. Um, so I'd just like to thank you all as panelists for tuning in, um, taking time out of your busy schedules to come speak with us. And for more of our content, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Twitter, we're everywhere. Thank you so much. Thank you. Enjoyed it. You too. Thank you, everybody. Great to be on the panel. Okay. Lovely to meet you all. Yeah.